Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar, Corrective Action or Preventative Action, the new risk-based methodology for ISO 9001-2015. My name is Gus Oliveira and I'm an International Product and Market Manager here at SoftExpert. Today's webinar will be presented by Mr. Jason Telzak, a consultant who has more than 15 years of experience with audits and compliance in many different standards. I wish you all a great webinar. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I am actually in the U.S., so this is a morning first, so good morning to any U.S. people and good afternoon to the rest of the world. Again, we're talking about the changes to 9001 here uh, that just recently came out about two months ago. Um, my name is Jason Telzek. I'm the CEO and founder of JT Environmental Consulting. Uh, we do assist clients throughout the world. We started about 15 years ago, and we have quite a great portfolio, and we do have consultants throughout the world in the U.S., South America, Asia, Australia, and soon within the U.K., we do assist many different industries such as aerospace, automotive, e-waste, food, manufacturing, medical, de medical devices, non-for-profits, and watercraft. So basically we do do it all. Uh, again, we're here today to talk about quality. We're looking at the corrective action or preventive action based on the new risk-based methodology for ISO 9001, the 2015 version. Uh, it was published at the end of September, so again, it's very new, and with over 1.1 million certificates issued worldwide, ISO 9001 helps organizations demonstrate to customers what they can offer as far as products and services of consistently good quality. It also acts as a tool to streamline their processes and make them more efficient at what they do. Uh, this presentation and this update is so important because 9001 is the backbone of so many different standards not just ISO standards, but world standards, with a quality mentality. Because the, the beauty of 9001 is you can incorporate it into any organization, uh, anything that makes a widget, uh, any type of service industry. There's even some sports teams that have been ISO 9001 certified. Uh, it can really be used in almost any different area and make it any organization or business better. Uh, we're going to talk today how it's changed where originally you wanted to have quality in place to think about quality so that way you could fix any issues that came up. So that would be your corrective actions. And then as it grew mature, then they talked about preventive action, thinking about uh, what could potentially happen before it happens and fix it. And now we're going even further into a risk-based methodology. And if any of you have a safety background, uh, this has been there for a little bit uh, of a while, or even a food safety background with um, HACCP. There's more of a risk base there, and that's what 9001 is bringing to this 2015 um, standard. So again, to summarize, a corrective action is an action to eliminate the cause of a detected nonconformity or other undesirable situation. So again, if something has gone wrong, if you have painted everything red when you're making some balls and you're supposed to be painting everything purple and you've already shipped a bunch of these, then that's going to be something that already occurred. So you're going to have to correct that issue. Preventative action is an action to eliminate the cause of a potential nonconforming or other undesirable potential situation. So using that same analogy, if we shipped a bunch of balls that were the wrong color, a preventative action might be to ensure that we do not have any other colors. Maybe this plant in this specific location only has a color red and they only make red balls. Or maybe another location only makes purple balls. So you're going to take that potential, potential issue out of the equation. Uh, with this update, there are three main areas that have been updated and, and are different. Again, it's very important that if you want to know the differences, it's great that you're here during this webinar, but I'd highly suggest that you get the updated version of the standard. Uh, you can't really know what's going on if you can't actually refer to any documentation or any sources. Uh, so the three main changes, a huge change of process approach, consistent results, consistent results, excuse me, uh, aligning with the standard and the direction of the organization. So this is Instead of just having the 9001 sit by itself, you're going to weave it into your organization a lot more than it used to be. Uh, 
so a lot of companies before would have it just be stand alone documentation. Um, when the auditor comes in, here's our manual, here's a big binder. That was never the idea. The idea is to make your organization better, to streamline what goes on. If you're doing a bunch of unnecessary paperwork and 20 different people are touching the same piece of paper, you need to streamline that process. Streamlining it will add more efficiency, will improve your quality, and in the long run, it should be saving you money as well. Uh, they also updated the PDCA, the Plan, Do, Check, Act principles from an individual process. It's great to look at each thing, but we need to look at it as a holistic system. Now, if we look at each little process, this piece of machinery here, um, this service that we're providing our customer, that's great to look at it, but you need to do that for your organization as a whole. If all these little tasks are running very well, that's great, but is your organization running well? And do all these little tasks, are they interconnected the way that they should be? You know, you could have an amazing team, you could have an amazing product, but if everyone's not working together, it's not gonna, it's, you're eventually gonna fail, there's eventually gonna be a quality issue. And again, the biggest one, we're going to risk-based thinking. Preventing undesirable outcomes, non-conforming products and services before they happen, thinking about them. I always tell people, or our clients, think about those really scary movies that are just, make no sense, where everyone goes, that would never happen in real life. If one bad thing leads to another bad thing to another bad thing, and it's the worst outcome possible, that could potentially happen. It's not just in a scary, odd movie. That could really, truly happen, and your business would fail. Your business would probably go out of business if it was a worst-case scenario. So do try to think about those. You're going to need to do more exercises before you implement new products, during new product cycles. And it's, this is going to be an ongoing thing. Again, unfortunately, a lot of people get certified, and they do not treat their systems as a management system. They just do work a few times during the year to stay certified. That's not the point here. The point is have good quality all the time. So let's talk about the process approach. It involves a systematic definition and management of processes and their interactions so as to achieve the intended results in accordance with the quality policy and strategic direction of the organization. Management of the processes and the system as a whole can be achieved using the PDCA cycle, again, plan, do, check, act with an overall focus on risk-based thinking aimed at taking advantage of opportunities and preventing undesirable results. Again, this is taken directly from the new standard. They're talking about your whole company, your whole organization, looking at all the quality along the way through risk-based thinking. And doing that, again, you're one step ahead of preventing, uh, preventing any issues, being proactive, Process approach. The application of the process approach in a quality management system enables an understanding and consistency in meeting the requirements, which again, you should already be adhering to, but they're reiterating this. The consideration of processes in terms of added value, the achievement of effect of process performance, and improvement of processes based on evaluation of data and information. I can't tell you how many times we have seen really, really strong organizations that do such a great job capturing data. How are sales? Are our clients happy? Did we get the surveys back? That's great. And they get all this awesome data and then they don't do anything with it. They simply do not improve upon all that great information that they've captured. And that's such a shame. Make sure that you're continually evaluating the data and the information of what's going on. And in doing so, you will be adding value to whatever service or whatever product you're creating. PDCA, first part, plan. Establish the objectives for the system and its processes and the resources needed to deliver the results in accordance with customers' requirements and the organization's policies. Also identify and address risks and opportunities. This is a pretty huge statement here. Uh, this is almost the groundwork for a majority of the core of your system for 9001 here. You're going to need to know your objectives. What are you trying to achieve? Let everyone know in the organization. Write it down so it's documented so everyone knows what you're trying to achieve. 
what resources are going to be needed? Does management need to provide more money for better training? Does management need to provide more personnel to create this product? Does management need to provide more lighting so everyone can see what they're doing better, so you can make a better product? You really need to think about this. What's your customer's requirements? If you don't know what your customer's needs are, then how are you going to make a good product? If your customer says, I want a ball to bounce so high, then obviously that's where your engineering should be. But if you're just making balls all the time, obviously your customers aren't going to want them if they're flat, if they're deflated, whatever. You really need to focus on what your customers need, and what they want, and their feedback. That's why surveys are so important. And within all this, again, you need policies and procedures to talk about all these and realize what you need to do. Now the doing. Do you implement what's planned? So you said you're going to do all these great things. Are you actually doing it? Hopefully you are. If you're only doing 75% of it, you should be able to realize that when you're doing your management reviews, when you're doing your internal audits, that you're falling short. Check. We're monitoring. And we're applicable. We're going to measure processes and the resulting products and services against policies, objectives, requirements, planned activities, and report the results. This is what I just talked about. We need to review. You said in the planning that you're going to do this task. You're going to make this awesome product. You're going to do a great job. And the doing, you allegedly did this. The checking is, did you actually do this? And again, if it isn't documented, then it didn't really happen. An auditor can't audit you. They can't know what's going on within your organization. They're not there every day, every other day, twice a year. No, they're just there for the audits. So you need to document this to prove it. And then you need to act. You need to take actions to improve the performance. What if the check realized that we are only at 75%? Where are we lacking the 25? Again, it goes back to the planning. Do we need more resources? Or does it mean that we're actually just not doing what we said we were going to do? You might say that you're going to do a really, really good job and fall short. We're going to test 100% of the products we make. And then you only, only end up testing 75 because it's slowing down production. Well, 75% of testing is still great, a validation. So just change your procedures to say that. Again, uh, this should be a bit of a review for the core ideas of 9001. But if you've never seen this, uh, here's a plan, do, check, act, flow map, flow chart, so you can see how everything interacts. You have your leadership in the middle, you have your support, your performance, your improvement, your planning, and it's a circle of the plan to check that. It's going around and around and around. This one does a good job of showing you the different areas of 9001, where the whole thing is your quality management system, section four. Your leadership is section five. Your section six is planning, seven, eight, nine, and then 10. So it does a good job showing you. And it also shows you your inputs and your outputs of what should be going on. So risk-based method methodology. You need to have a risk-based thinking. This enables an organization to determine the factors that could cause the processes and its quality management system to deviate from the planned results, to put in place preventative controls to minimize, to minimize negative effects, and to make maximum use of opportunities as they arise. Again, this is taken directly from the new standard. Again, I can't stress enough that you need to get the new standard. Uh, to know what you're actually doing here. So again, risk-based thinking. You need to think of things ahead of time. You need to do the right things. Sorry, went ahead. Risk-based thinking. This is going to be found in Clause 8.4. is essential for achieving an effective quality management system. The concept of risk-based thinking has been implicit in previous editions of the ISO standard and it also talks about preventative actions before to eliminate potential nonconformities. But by analyzing any nonconformities that do occur and taking action to prevent reoccurrence, that's appropriate for the effects of the nonconformity. So if you keep having some issues that take place and you have some corrective actions to fix that, hopefully not just band-aids, hopefully it's not just a quick step to fix the issue immediately. Hopefully, you're doing a root cause analysis. You're thinking about your five whys to go deeper into what the issue actually is. Now, if you fix that issue, great. But 
if you thought of a potential issue or it was a, a close call and you miss, maybe that's going to be your preventative. But we're talking about risk-based. We need to think about all these things beforehand. If you're in an organization and you're making pizzas every day and you said, you know what, we're making a pizza, it's 10 inches, this is what we've done for the past 50 years, we're thinking about making an 8-inch pizza and we're thinking about making a 12-inch pizza. What are going to be the issues when you start making that? What are going to be the potential threats, the risks? What quality do you have to think about when making that pizza that's different? Do you need different machinery? Is that going to require more training? You need to think about all these things ahead of time. You need to conform to the requirements of the new ISO standard and the organization needs to plan and implement actions to address the risks and opportunities. This is good. We keep talking about risk, but we're also not talking about the opportunities. You need the opportunities that go along with the risks. What have you, you've, th you've thought about all the risks, but what are the opportunities here? Uh, if we make a different product and we do it better, is that going to mean that we're going to have to make more of that product? So are we going to have to actually up our distribution? Are we going to have to change the methodology of our work hours? Do we need two shifts? Do we need a night shift? Uh, do we need an extra maintenance crew? Think of the good opportunities too. And addressing both risks and opportunities establishes a basis for increasing the effectiveness of the quality management system, achieving improved results and preventing negative effects. Again, if you have a good game plan and you've thought of everything before it happens, ideally you should mitigate a lot of these risks. And if something does happen, hopefully you've talked about it. I said, what if there is a flood because we're located close to the ocean? We've already thought about that. We'll check the weather, we'll move this machinery, we'll tell all of our clients we're shutting down for two weeks. You need to think about these issues. Opportunities can arise as a result of a situation favorable to achieving an intended result. For example, a set of circumstances that allow the organization to attract customers, develop new products and services, reduce waste, or improve productivity. Actions to address opportunities can also include consideration of associated risks. Risk is the effect of uncertainty, and any such uncertainty can have positive or negative effects. A positive deviation arising from a risk can provide an opportunity, but not all positive effects of risk results and opportunities. So again, what if you had a client say, hey, can you make us this product? And you never thought about that. You say, sure, we can try. You've just created a new product line. You've just made more money. You've just made more revenue. But when you're thinking about that line and when that customer approached you, you need to think about all the potential risks. What could happen? What do we need? Do we have the right infrastructure? Do we have the right personnel? What does this client really want? What do they really need as far as what we're going to make? So, risk, the effect. Risk is a potential of losing something of value. I'm sorry, let me back up here. So, the effect of uncertainty. It's a very small definition in the new 9000 because again, 9000 is a definition for the 9001 standard. Uh, but if we look up wiki, this is what they say, I'm sorry, Wikipedia. Risk is the potential of losing something of value. Values such as physical health, social status, emotional well-being, or financial wealth can be gained or lost when taking risk results from a given action, activity, or inaction, foreseen or unforeseen. And that's big. I think this is a really good definition because the taking the action or inaction so, again, if you see that you're manufacturing too many products and uh, your conveyor system is supposed to run at, um, you know, 10 widgets an hour and you need to increase production, so now you've cranked it up to 30 per hour and the machine just can't handle it, your inaction of not doing preventive maintenance on that machine that you're running too hard is going to be a, a risk. It's going to fail eventually. So again, being inactive is just as bad as not being active. Not seeing something, not thinking about something. Let's continue with the definition. 
Uncertainty is a potential, unpredictable, unmeasurable, and uncontrollable outcome. Risk is the consequence of action taken in spite of uncertainty. This is a good second half of this definition. So they're talking about unmeasurable and uncontrollable. That's the whole point here, is we're trying to control your processes, your services, what you're doing, no matter what it is in quality. You want to have the control. You want to think about the potential issues. You want to have a system in place. What if a machine breaks down? Well, we have a backup machine. What if the power goes out? We have backup power. What is it if there's a natural disaster? Well, then we shift all of our production to our other plants. Think about those beforehand so that you're controlling any outcome. You're controlling any risk. And the unmeasurable. Again, we need to be documenting everything. We need to be looking at what you're currently doing, what you could be doing, your feedback, and we need to be documenting all of this. So what does the Webster Dictionary define risk as? The possibility that something bad or unpleasant, such as an injury or a loss, will happen. Someone or something that may cause something bad or unpleasant to happen, and a person or a thing that someone judges to be good or bad, choice for insurance or loan, etc. Uh, this definition is good. I, I like this first part where it says someone or something that causes something bad or unpleasant to happen. This is a big deal too. Do you need to worry about threats? Do you, does your business operate in a certain industry where you may have potential threats, unfortunately? Um, are they internal? Do you have a disgruntled worker that could ruin your product? If you're making one certain color or something, could they throw something in there into that vat of whatever to change the color? Um, could they tamper with your products or could it really harm something if you're making food? And the same thing for outside threats. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the world is a scary place and not everyone is a happy person. So is someone going to try and intentionally harm your products, your employees, uh, disrupt your services? Uh, it, it could be Something as simple as a peaceful demonstration for political reasons has the streets blocked and now your product can't get through that route and you're late and your material expires. It's very important to think about all these potential issues. So again, risk. It's a possibility of loss or injury, so the peril. Someone or something that creates or suggests a hazard. The chance of loss or perils to the subject matter of insurance or contracts, the degree, degree of probability of such loss, which we're going to talk about later, a person or thing that is specified hazard to the insurer, an insurance hazard from a specified cause or source, and the chance that an investment will be lost as a value, again, from Webster. I'm sorry, we seem to be going the wrong direction there. Uh, we already talked about the risk from 9001 and what the new one is. So, what is the potential impact? What is the severity? How important is this and how much can it affect your customers, your product, your organization? So, what's the impact? How large will that be? You need to think about that. And again, we need to document this and we'll show that in a few coming slides how to do that. And what's the probability or likelihood? Does it happen often? Uh, Again, if you're located by the ocean, is it going to flood? Is it going to be a storm annually? Is it a 100-year flood? Um, what's the probability of likelihood if you're taking a certain route and the bridges get washed out? You need to look at that. So again, how deep could this harm your organization or product, and how often does that occur? So what you need to do is you need to create a risk assessment matrix. You can set up however you want. Some people have the numbers go from high to low or low to high. So on this one, we're looking at severity on the left. So catastrophic, we're going to rate it as a 1, critical 2, moderate 3, and negligible, we're going to put as a 4. And what's the probability? We're going to put this as frequently, likely, occasionally, seldom, or unlikely. So everything in the red here would obviously be very, very negative to your organization, to your product, to everything as a whole. So when you break out your risk-based analysis and your, your thought process here, um, and you're actually either going through 
each process, um, each type of machinery or your organization as a whole, this is what you're going to want to create here. So obviously anything that's going to be frequent and catastrophic, that would be horrible. That, that's probably going to be a game changer for your organization. So that's going to be in the red. And then you have these things that might happen moderately in the blue. Maybe they happen, maybe it's pretty severe um, and they happen every once in a while. So we're going to put that in the blue. And then your middle ground to not affecting you too much would be your greens. And then your whites would ideally be what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis uh, because of your really good risk-based thinking steps that are in place so your organization is running a bit smoothly. So risk analysis process, we're going to look at risk management, risk analysis, and risk communication. We're going to look at the identification, the measurement, and how the management of a bench, which could adversely affect the impact of the organization. So, the identification. You need to realize what's going on here. You need to protect your brand. Anything negative in the press, social media, today it's insane. You could do nothing wrong, but if it's perceived as wrong, you could really be affected by social media. So, you need to protect your brand so that way you keep making a good product, you keep having a great service, and it continues. Uh, financial and non-financial. Think about that. Is it going to harm you? If you lose one client, okay, we lost a few thousand dollars. But is that a big client where you're going to lose millions? Very important. Organizational factors. What's going to happen within your organization? Is it going to affect your workforce? Uh, if you lose a top management, can your company still keep moving? Uh, if someone leaves the organization, if they're fired, uh, if unfortunately they pass away, how can that organization keep functioning? It, you need to think of each person within that, and that's why you should have org charts within your ISO 9000 to see how everyone is affecting everyone else. Your operational factors, uh, if this piece of machinery goes down, if the power goes out, um, if this side of the facility we just can't get to, you know, how is that going to happen? External factors, we talked about threats, uh, but also that could be natural, um, and it could just be haphazard. Um, just be aware of it and think of any potential risk or issue that could occur. And again, staffing issues. Uh, I see this a lot where someone may have an employee that just isn't doing a good job, and then we ask them, well, did you train them? And the answer is 50-50. Uh, what if they did train them and they're still not doing a good job? Well, then you need to retrain them. And if you retrain them again and they keep failing, then either you need to move them to a different position or you may need to fire them. And if they're doing a poor job and you say, well, did you train them? They say, no, no. Well, maybe that's a problem. Maybe you need to retrain them. Maybe they got hired five years ago and they started doing the wrong thing and they just need some retraining. Or maybe they were never trained initially. It can also be a big deal. Um, as strange as this also sounds, make sure that that person is right for that task that they're doing. Uh, I can't tell you how odd it is to go into an organization, and I've seen this a few times, but one in particular where literally there's one person doing a process and they weren't very good at it because they just weren't built for that. They were physically short and the process was on taller tables and they couldn't reach. And then right next to them was an individual that was extremely tall working on a task that was made for a short person. It was very odd and all we do is have them switch the people and they're way more efficient. Risk analysis process, process to eliminate the risk or reduce the risk to an acceptable level. If everyone cannot work efficiently because it's just too loud within the facility, maybe you need earplugs. If everyone's performing a task and maybe they are worried that they're not going to do it fast enough, maybe you need to add more employees. It's very simple. Take away any levels of unacceptable quality issues wherever you can. Think about it beforehand. And please mitigate these. So what's your mitigation plan? Uh, there's none in place. That's not good. You need a plan for this. What happens if a hurricane comes through? We don't have any plans. Well, that's not going to help. There's a hurricane coming next week. Okay, well, let's do some planning. 
well, we're going to shut down the facility. Great. And then when you're going to, do you have startup procedures? Do you have shutdown procedures? So that way all the equipment works and everyone knows what to do. And then if you do have a good plan, how are you going to implement that? Okay, our plan is to shut down the facility for a hurricane. Great. Uh, who calls who? Who knows what's going on? You need to implement that. You need to complete the task. And then let's say that you did have a hurricane. You had all these great procedures in place. Everyone knew what to do. You shut down the facility. And everyone came back to the facility and started up, and everything was great. There was minimal damage. Everything was fine. Um, does anything need refining? Was everyone informed right away? Did everyone know what to do? Uh, what were the logistics there? So refine it. Make it better. You need to define the responsibilities. Again, let's use the same analogy. So who's calling who? He's, who's emailing who? Is there a emergency set up as far as if the power goes down, if the internet goes out, uh, how is communication going to continue? Uh, or the action plans or the time frames? Is it a two-week shutdown, a six-month shutdown, a one-month? Uh, and what are your expected outcomes? If you're really shutting down for this long, how long can you get shut down and come back up to keep your clients, to keep making a good product? You're going to lose some material sources. You know, if you're making this widget, and you need the materials from a local area, are they going to be depleted? If you're getting materials from somewhere far away, are they going to be able to get to your facility if the infrastructure isn't there? And then you're going to, re you're going to review and report and control these mechanisms. Again, you're going to think of every possible issue that could happen, every risk, and you're going to think of how to correct it or how to work around it. And again, you're going to evaluate the effectiveness of the actions that you take. So if you have put this in process, let's take a look at it, or if you just run through the uh, analogies and, you know, the planning, is this really going to work? You may have a great plan, but if it's unrealistic, then it really won't work. If you say, okay, well, we're going to shut down for six months and keep paying our employees, even though we're not getting money in, do you really have that much money set aside? If you don't, then that's a great plan, but it's not going to work. Risk communication. Make sure you're communicating with all the interested and affected groups. If you don't tell everyone what's going on or what to do, how are they going to know how to do it? And make sure that they know how you're communicating. This is key. How do you communicate to your employees now? Do you have a, a message board up, a communications board? Do you post that in the lunchroom or the break room? Do you email that to everyone? Do you have a chat room? Um, you know, how's everyone aware? And make sure that it takes place throughout the whole risk analysis process. Each person in this chain that you're creating, they need to be aware of what's going on. Provide guidance on how the risk should be managed. You're going to have to tell these people what's going on. Provide information on the states and basis for decisions. Uh, you know, let your employees be a part of this. If they say, hey, why are we doing it this way? Why don't we do it this way? They may have a better idea than you do if you're in management. They do this day in and day out. Use them as a resource and let them know why you're doing what. So that way, if they have a better idea, they can let you know, or just so that they're fully aware of what's going on. There needs to be a two-way exchange of information. Uh, again, most organizations have suggestion boxes. If anyone wants to inform management of what's going on um, and without any risks or without any potential issues of feeling like they might be judged, it's a good way to do it anonymously. Um, other organizations have call lines emails where you can just, you know, email suggestions, whatever works best for you. But make sure that there is a two-way exchange of information. It's not just one-sided. And this will all, doing all these steps will enhance the understanding of the risk. Without communicating to anyone, no one's going to know. Again, you can have the best plan in the world, but if you're the owner and you've locked yourself in your office and you've created this great plan you haven't told anyone, it's not really great yet. It's just a good idea. It needs to be implemented. So getting back to the severity or the impact on what you're doing or what you're making, you need to think about your overall product or service, uh, the reputation that you currently have, how much this will affect you financially, the health and safety of not just your employees, but of the products that you're making, of everyone outside, and your visitors. If you don't have a safe environment, you don't want your visitors to get hurt either. Social, or how much effect it might have on the community, very important. 
media involvement. Make sure you have a spokesperson and make sure that spokesperson is available and aware of what's going on. We just talked about the communication. They need to be aware of what is the game plan. What's the, what are we doing? Where are we within this process? Are we still in the planning stage? Uh, has there been a crisis and we're acting on it? What's the next step in this crisis? So that way they know what to say. And legally, make sure that you're okay legally. So again, looking at all of that, we need to look at this chart again. If it's very bad, catastrophic, it happens a lot on a daily, hourly basis, that could be really bad in the red. If it doesn't happen that often, it's very unlikely. And if it's a negligible outcome, then if it's really not going to affect anyone, then that's going to be in the white. So let's define some of these things. So again, the severity. If we're looking at catastrophic or critical, this could mean the death of a person. It could be a very significant financial loss, like the company going out of business. You need to rate these once you make this chart. And again, you're going to rate it for your organization based on what service you're providing or what you're making or what you're doing. So not everyone's going to have the same thing. Maybe your product or your service has nothing to do with the death of a person. Maybe it has nothing to do with the financial loss. Uh, if you're a government entity, you're probably not going to go out of business. But how is that going to affect everyone in a catastrophic way? Does that mean someone might not get benefits? You might not be helping someone? You need to do this chart for your organization. Again, an example, high, we're looking at extensive injuries to people. Maybe it's a bad loss where the company won't go out of business, but it's hurting and it needs to go look for investors. If it's moderate or medium, maybe there's some injuries that require medical treatment. Maybe there's a significant loss where no one's going to get bonuses this year or you need to really be tight with the money. Uh, low, you're going to have minor injuries or minor financial loss. Um, you know, again, we're doing quality here. Low is good, but we want very low. We want negligible. We want no injuries. We want no embarrassment. We want no media coverage. We want almost no loss of revenue. That would be if you make a product and you catch it in-house with your quality system. Okay, we made a thousand of these widgets. It's going to go on the truck. We just packaged it up. We have our final inspection, and oh no, our inspector on the final inspection saw that this is not acceptable. That's great. You caught it in-house. Maybe it only cost you as much to produce that for the time and money. Um, that's great. Let's put this in the let's put it in a quarantine area, and we'll look at it later. We'll figure out what we did wrong, or do we have to shut down everything now? That would be great. That's your best case scenario for your negligible um, severity chart. And then you also have to do this with the probability. Again, looking at your product or your service to create this chart. Are we looking at this happening daily, hourly? How likely is it to occur? Maybe daily, maybe once a week. Is it occasionally? Maybe it's monthly, or maybe it's quarterly. Seldom? Is it annually, every one to five years? Or is it really, really unlikely? Maybe every 10 to 50 years. Again, we're talking about weather. We're talking about a 100-year flood. Um, maybe if you're looking at uh, some raw materials, um, maybe you're looking at some elements in the earth, you know, when is that going to run out? Maybe a thousand years. How unlikely is it? And again, for your organization, figure that out. Sources for today. Uh, we took a lot of information from ISO.org. Um, obviously, we put wherever it was new for the new standard. Again, I cannot stress enough to get a copy of that. If your company is certified to 9001, you must have a copy. Um, otherwise, the auditor could write you up. And again, uh, a good resource is uh, my company, JT Environmental Consulting, which you see there. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. I know that it was a bit of an overview for what 9001 has in place before this 2015 update. But again, today we're really talking about how we've gone from corrective actions, which is fixing something that's gone wrong, to preventative, we prevent it before it happens and think about how to mitigate that, to doing a risk-based, which is basically like preventative on steroids, where you're really looking at every, every potential opportunity to harm your product or service and how to fix those beforehand so that it works out better. Uh, thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, you can please write them down. Uh, they will be funneled to me, and then we can go over what's going on today.
Thank you. Thank you all who took part in our presentation. If you have any questions or would like to get in touch with Mr. Telezak, please email him at jason at jtenv.com. For more webinars, please visit our website at www.softexpert.com. See you next time.